The member for London West. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, I am uh, very pleased to bring this bill forward today. Uh, but before I do, I want to recognize some of my sisters who are here in the gallery with us today. Yolanda McLean, who is QP Ontario's second vice president, Christine Laverty and Laura Thompson from OPSU Provincial Women's Committee, Angela Thompson and Sarah LaBelle, also from OPSU. I uh, thank them for their support. and I. I also want to recognize some of the other organizations that have expressed uh, support for my bill, including the Canadian Resource Centre for Victims of Crime, Women Abuse Council of Toronto, Women at the Centre, the Canadian Labour Congress, Ontario Federation of Labour, uh, ETFO, OECTA, UNIFOR, the Toronto Medical Officer of Health, the Centre for Research and Education on Violence Against Women and Children, and many more. Um, speaker, this bill addresses the gap that exists in the government's current uh, initiative to, to uh, deal with sexual violence and domestic violence through Bill 132, uh, as well as its Never Okay Action Plan. Uh, it is an evidence-based bill that is informed by research and the experience of other jurisdictions. It is the missing piece that was highlighted during the hearings of the Select Committee on Sexual Violence and Harassment, during the public input that the Social Policy Committee received on Bill 132, during the Changing Workplaces Review, and during the Gender Wage gap consultations. So the bill honours uh, all that was heard throughout all those different consultation processes and also uh, some of the recommendations of the final report of the Select Committee on Sexual Violence and Harassment. Passing this bill will further Ontario's reputation as a leader in addressing sexual violence and domestic violence and ultimately through mandatory workplace training in reducing gender-based violence across the province. Uh, the purpose of this bill is to amend the Employment Standards Act to require employers to provide up to 10 days of paid leave as well as reasonable unpaid leave to workers who have experienced domestic violence or sexual violence or whose children have experienced those forms of violence. The leave can only be taken for specific purposes related to or arising from the violence, and that includes seeking medical attention, uh, going to a victim services organization, a rape crisis center, a, a sexual assault center, a woman's shelter, any one of these myriad community organizations that support uh, survivors, uh, to see a psychologist or, uh, or another uh, professional counselor, to relocate, which we know is a, is a very real likelihood for women who are fleeing domestic violence or to meet with law enforcement officials or, uh, or participate in legal proceedings. And this is important, uh, Speaker, because uh, throughout this whole last year of the Select Committee on Sexual Violence and Harassment, throughout the, the government's action plan, uh, what we heard repeatedly from the people who, who, spoke to, uh, who spoke to the Select Committee was that we need to take a survivor-centric a survivor approach to dealing with these issues. We need to consider the survivor survivor's perspective uh, when we're looking at the needs of those who have experienced domestic violence or sexual assault. And from this perspective, whether the violence was experienced at home, on a date, at work, uh, anywhere in the community, the basic needs of survivors, uh, the supports they need to help them heal are the same. Uh, health services from a nurse, a physician, a psychologist, counselling from a rape crisis centre or a woman's shelter, as I said, moving to a new residence, uh, uh, potentially a woman's shelter or, uh, or some other kind of, uh, of second stage housing. And of course, uh, if, uh, if survivors decide to report the violence, and as we know, uh, that only represents about 10% of survivors, but, but if they do report, there are meetings with the police, there are meetings with lawyers, uh, there's the time that has to be spent preparing for a court trial if the case goes to court, and then uh, testifying on the witness stand. So recognizing that survivors of domestic violence and sexual violence should not have to jeopardize their employment because of the harm they experienced. Uh, this bill uh, um, puts in place protections to uh, enable women to, uh, to um, deal with the violence, to seek the support that they need uh, without risking uh, their, their job. Uh, we know that a number of U.S. states have already passed legislation to provide unpaid leave 
Committee for Domestic Violence, Sexual Assault and Stalking, and those include California, um, Colorado, Florida, Hawaii, Illinois, Kansas, Maine, New York City, Oregon, Philadelphia and Washington. But it's also true that uh, many survivors of domestic violence and sexual violence can't afford to take unpaid leave, and uh, that, that applies particularly to people who are most vulnerable and also uh, have higher, um, are more likely to, uh, to be victims of sexual violence or domestic violence, such as uh, racialized women, women with disabilities, uh, LGBTQ uh, individuals, and others. So the, the District of Columbia provides paid uh, domestic violence and sexual assault leave of three to seven days. And in November 2015, Manitoba became the first Canadian province to provide paid leave for domestic violence. NDP government, by the way. Um, I, uh, I uh, expect that, uh, that some of the members to my right may, may uh, raise concerns about what this is going to mean for employers. Isn't paid leave going to be too onerous for employers to manage? Will it open the floodgates to workers to, uh, to claim uh, unjustifiably uh, a leave of absence? Well, uh, with regard to the second point, the bill does include a provision for, to allow employers to request reasonable evidence that the leave is for one of the purposes that's specified in the bill. And this can be done either through uh, future regulation or through adjudication by the Ministry of Labour. Certainly, uh, throughout that process, we'll want to ensure that the evidence does not impose too high of a bar, that it ends up preventing workers from accessing the leave. Uh, we know from other jurisdictions, Speaker, in Australia, there are paid leave provisions across probably a third of the workplace. And uh, uh, a 2014 study found that employees who access the leave requested just one to three days of paid leave. Uh, Australia is really leading the way on issues of domestic violence in the workplace. Uh, there was a report in November 2015 called Male Champions of Change, which was, is an initiative involving 30 CEOs and high-profile leaders uh, in business and the public sector. And, uh, and they recognized that paid leave, which in addition to other leave entitlements, is critical to help employees experiencing violence to maintain their employment and to ensure their financial security. And that report recognized 10 days of paid leave as a developing norm across that country. And one of the CEOs who's involved in the initiative said his firm has 32,000 employees. Only 22 had accessed the paid domestic leave uh, over the last six months with an average leave of 2.3 days. So this leave will not cause financial hardship for employees or for employers, but the reality is that employers are pay, will have to pay now or they'll have to pay later because there are significant financial costs to employers associated with domestic violence and sexual violence in, uh, in the workplace. Uh, there are costs associated with reduced uh, productivity, increased absenteeism, uh, decreased employee morale. The costs of, of replacing, uh, recruiting, training new employees if victims resign because they can't, they can't manage the violence that they've experienced with their job, uh, or they may be dismissed for, uh, for uh, performance reasons. Uh, there was recently a, a Canadian study that looked at domestic violence in the workplace that was conducted by the Centre for Research and Education on, on uh, Violence Against Women and Children. Uh, this was a national survey of more than 80 400 respondents, half of them were from Ontario. A third of the respondents said that they had experienced domestic violence, and another third said they believed they had a co worker who was experiencing domestic violence. Uh, not surprisingly, four out of five of these people said, or the, the victims, the survivors, said that the violence had affected their job performance, but less expected, perhaps 30 percent of the co workers who were aware of somebody else experiencing violence also felt stressed uh, in their workplace. So the effects of uh, domestic violence in the workplace are pervasive. They affect not only the employee who's experiencing the violence, but also those around them. 
And finally, Speaker, I want to, uh, to touch on a, uh, another very important provision of my bill, and that is the requirement for mandatory workplace training on uh, domestic violence and sexual violence. Uh, as I, uh, the survey that I just referred to asked uh, respondents, do you get information about uh, domestic violence in the workplace? Uh, less than a third. Of, uh, of the workplaces said that, uh, that, they're, that they were receiving information uh, in their workplace, even though we have uh, Bill 168, we have uh, legislation under, under the Occupational Health and Safety Act that requires workers just to provide that information. Uh, employers are not uh, are fulfilling their obligations under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, so we need to make uh, mandatory requirements for this information to be provided. But more than information, we need training. Uh, we know that, uh, that people who are experiencing uh, domestic violence in the workplace are quite likely to disclose to a co-worker. 43% disclose their violence to somebody they're working with. Co-workers don't feel equipped to be able to know how to deal with a disclosure of domestic violence. So, so uh, information and, more importantly, training in the workplace uh, is critical. There is an excellent information and training package that was funded uh, several years ago by the Ontario government, and I do give them credit for it. Uh, it is called Make It Our Business, a very rich and robust uh, information and training package available to all employers across this uh, province on a voluntary basis. And the Select Committee received a presentation about this Make It Our Business training package, uh, and we're, we were told uh, when asked how many employers are participating, how many are taking up this excellent uh, uh, training package, uh, we learned that about 1%, 1% of Ontario employers are bringing this kind of training into the workplace uh, to, to uh, engage their, uh, their uh, workers in, in recognizing the signs of domestic violence and also uh, knowing what to do uh, if a co-worker discloses. Um, so, uh, Speaker, I ask all MPPs uh, to do the right thing. Let's solidify Ontario's status as a leader on sexual violence and domestic violence and vote to pass my bill. Thank you.